Sam Harris is author of Letter to a Christian Nation. Ressa Aslan is author of No God But God. Next on Book TV, they debate religion and secularism. L.A. Times book columnist Jonathan Kirsch moderates. It's about an hour and a half. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Allowed at Central Library. I'm Louise Steinman, the curator of the series, and of course I'm thrilled to present this evening with Reza Aslan, Sam Harris, and Jonathan Kirsch in a discussion titled, Can Religion and Reason Be Reconciled? There are many issues rolled up in this great blintz of a title, uh, though I, can't, I can guarantee that tonight's debate will be very spirited. I can't guarantee that we're going to come to any conclusions, definitive conclusions. Is rationality the right standard to invoke in the context of matters of faith? Can faith and reason be reconciled? Should they be? What is more important perhaps than coming to conclusions, at least to me, is the fact that tonight's speakers and you, the audience, feel welcome and encouraged to engage in a free and open debate on this topic. I was very honored. Um, it's been almost a year when Reza proposed uh, doing this for Allowed. And I really thought, what better place to have this discussion than the Los Angeles Public Library, an institution dedicated to free access for all uh, to ideas and information. So it is in that spirit that we will proceed tonight. Uh, before we begin, would you please turn off your cell phones and pagers? I think I did as well, so we can all be present in the room. Uh, for the format tonight, um, after our conversation, after the debate with Jonathan moderating, um, our mod our Panelists will be delighted to take some of your questions. Um, we will have a microphone uh, circulating in the room. C-SPAN is filming tonight, and we also record for possible podcasts. So we ask that you wait until the microphone comes to you so that we can all hear the questions. Uh, the C-SPAN uh, will be broadcasting over the next couple of months. They'll probably do it several times. Sam, Reza, and Jonathan will be signing books in the lobby after the program, and books are for sale tonight, courtesy of the library store. So after the program, you can meet us in the lobby for the book signing. All three participants tonight are accomplished authors and speakers, so I'm not going to give you their long versions of their bios. They all have websites, so here are just some highlights of who these three participants are. Reza Aslan is an internationally acclaimed writer and scholar of religions. He's the Middle East commentator for NPR's Marketplace and Muslim Affairs Analyst for CBS News. He's currently a research associate at the University of Southern California's Center on Public Diplomacy. His first book, No God But God, The Origins, Evolution, and Future of Islam, has been translated into half a dozen languages and was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award. Sam Harris is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The End of Faith, and Letter to a Christian Nation. He's a graduate in philosophy from Stanford University and has studied both Eastern and Western religious traditions along with a variety of contemplative disciplines for 20 years. He's now completing a doctorate in neuroscience. His book, The End of Faith, won the 2005 Penn Award for nonfiction and several foreign editions are in press. Jonathan Kirsch, uh, actually Sam joked that Jonathan had written more books than he and uh, Reza combined, which is true, is the author of the best-selling A History of the End of the World, How the Most Controversial Book in the Bible Changed the Course of Western Civilization and nine other books, including the national bestseller The Harlot by the Side of the Road, Forbidden Tales of the Bible, and the best-selling God Against the Gods, The History of the War Between Monotheism and Polytheism. Jonathan is also a longtime book reviewer for the Los Angeles Time. He broadcasts on the NPR affiliates KCRW, FM, and KPCC, and he's an adjunct professor on the faculty of NYU. And just as his day job, he's an attorney specializing in publishing law and intellectual property in Los Angeles. Before we begin tonight, uh, Jonathan, Reza, Sam, and I would like to dedicate this program to the memory of the Turkish-Armenian journalist Hrant Dink. So we will uh, offer this in his memory. Please welcome Reza Aslan, Sam Harris, and Jonathan Kirsch. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Louise. 
Uh, it's really my honor to be here tonight with Sam and Reza. It's the only event I've ever attended uh, for which tickets sold out in 90 minutes and people began to implore me if I could get them in the door. It's like a Rolling Stones concert. <laughs> Uh, I would like to say, uh, to elaborate on the, the dedication tonight, uh, Hrant Dink was uh, famously convicted under uh, Section 301 of the Turkish Penal Code, uh, which criminalizes so-called anti-conduct uh, uh, insulting Turkishness. Uh, uh, it reminds us that religion is only one of the markers by which human beings distinguish themselves from each other declare each other's to be enemies and sometimes kill each other. Uh, the Turkish and our Armenian conflict is religious in part, but it's also ethnic and national. And as we have our conversation tonight, I think you'll see that theme come up again and again. I'd also like to say just uh, <clears throat> in the interests of kind of uh, leveling the playing field, uh, that we might also dedicate the evening to other victims of hatred, small mindedness, and violence. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin, murdered by Yigal Amir, a Jewish religious fanatic. Dr. Barnett Slepian, an obstetrician and gynecologist, murdered by James Charles Kopp, a Christian religious fanatic. And the worshipers at the mosque of the cave of patriarchs who were machine gunned while worshiping by a Jewish religious fanatic and a medical doctor named Baruch Goldstein. Uh, a friend of mine, and I understand a friend of Reza's, uh, a wonderful writer named Karen Armstrong, uh, has pointed out that one of the identifying characteristics of the human race, which used to be thought of as uh, our capacity to make tools, that's what distinguished us from the lower orders, and then it was discovered that some animals could make tools. <laughs> Uh, that we had language, and it was discovered, of course, that animals have language. Uh, she's pointed out that what truly distinguishes the human race from the other orders of animals is our religious imagination, our capacity to imagine a higher power uh, at work in the world. So far, anyway, we don't think the animals have that capacity. Uh, Karen has written, uh, there's a case for arguing that Homo sapiens, rational or thinking man, is also Homo religiosus, religious man, believing man. Uh, and uh, that's another theme that I think we are going to visit again and again tonight. Uh, to get the conversation started, uh, I'd like to uh, ask the audience to indulge me. I'm going to read a quotation uh, from Reza's most recent book, or new book and from Sam's most recent book. Uh, which I think of as kind of matched, paired opposites, and then I'll invite each of you to see if you can reconcile your points of view. Uh, Reza writes, uh, religion is not concerned with genuine history, but with sacred history, which, is, which does not course through time like a river. Rather, sacred history is like a hallowed tree whose roots dig deep into primordial time and whose branches weave in and out of genuine history with little concern for the boundaries of space and time. Indeed, it is precisely at those moments when sacred and genuine history collide that religions are born. Whatever truths they convey have little to do with historical fact. To ask whether Moses actually parted the Red Sea or whether Jesus truly raised Lazarus from the dead or whether the word of God indeed poured through the lips of Muhammad is to ask totally irrelevant questions. The only questions that matter with regard to religion and its mythology is what do these stories mean? After all, religion is by definition interpretation and by definition all interpretations are valid. And I would pair that with a passage from Sam's book, uh, which will give you a flavor of Sam's book. Either the Bible is just an ordinary book written by mortals, or it isn't. Either Christ was divine, or he was not. If the Bible is an ordinary book, 
and Christ an ordinary man, the basic, basic doctrine of Christianity is false. And the history of Christian theology is the story of bookish men parsing a collective delusion. So let us be honest with ourselves. In the fullness of time, one side is really going to win this argument, and the other side is really going to lose. Now let me turn it back to you, Reza, to begin. Uh, is it true that all interpretations are valid, or can you imagine that someone could win this argument? Actually, I wish you would have read the, the sentence that followed that sentence, because while it is true that religion is by, interpretation, uh, by definition interpretation, and that by defini de definition all interpretations are valid, the next sentence in that book says, but some interpretations are more reasonable than others. And that, I think, is very important to note, because I think in many ways it goes to the heart of this discussion. Because this notion that somehow reason has no role to play in either religion or in the way that we understand and interpret religion, I think, is, is quite an absurd uh, notion. I think that by simply saying that, that various interpretations, the ways in which we experience scripture, the ways in which we experience the divine presence, whatever you want to refer to it, that those, in, those experiences are open to a whole host of interpretations. And indeed, uh, as Sam brings up, I mean, the Bible is a perfect example of it. Not all Christians read the Gospels and interpret it as in any way, shape, or form saying that Jesus is God. Um, not all Christians read the Bible and in any way agree that the Bible itself declares itself to be an inerrant or literal text by, by any means of the imagination. So to simply create these false dichotomies that you either believe that the Bible is the word of God or it's not and therefore the entire four or five thousand year history upon which the Bible you know, rests is, becomes illegitimate, I don't think that that's necessarily the best way to think about the, the role of, and function of religion. Sam. Um, well, it's interesting. Whenever I find myself in this position criticizing religion, if, if I say that, for instance, uh, Muslims are uh, not justified in their belief in martyrdom, for instance, or Christians are not justified to believe that, the, uh, that Jesus was born of a virgin, resurrected, will be coming back to earth to wield his magic powers. Uh, I'm often met by Christians and Muslims of a more moderate persuasion who will say that I have completely caricatured the faith, that I have taken extremists to be representative mm. of the faith. Um, and there are a few problems with this response. And I, I take your response, Ray, as a, as a version of that, that you know, not all Christians believe that X, Y, and Z. Um, first, it discounts the fact that, that so many millions and millions of Christians and Muslims do believe these things. I mean, we are living in a country where 53% of the, the population claims to believe that the, the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no precursors in the natural world uh, apart from Adam and Eve. I mean, that we did not evolve out of prior life forms. This is a majority of the American population. Uh, so it seems to me this is, you can call this extremism. I mean, this is, these views are extreme in almost every respect. They are extremely silly. They are, they are extremely worthy of our denigration, but they are not a, extreme in the sense of being rare. Um, so that's, that's one problem, that I, I think this, this moderate defense of religion where, in, where you sort of, uh, you can have this vaporous, very diaphanous uh, set of truth claims that are not really true. It's hard to know the difference between uh, religious claims to knowledge and mythology. Uh, it, it represents a misrepresentation of so many millions of people who, who, whose decision making is, is really a, of consequence to us. Um, the other problem is that it, it, it's, it's playing by a double standard that you would, you would be immediately hostile to in every other area of your lives because you're, these, these beliefs are claims about the way the world is. I mean, everyone is in the business of trying to understand the situation we're in, uh, trying to get our behavior to, to 
move through this situation in a way that's compatible with happiness. And religion is a strategy for doing it. It, it, it just happens to be a strategy that is built to a remarkable degree upon lies and self-deception. Uh, and it, so, so I argue it's, it's the wrong tool for the job. And that's, that's I mean, we're, we clearly disagree. I was waiting for my quote to see how I disagreed with Reza. But. <laughs> well, I find this very interesting because I think that there are certainly multiple means through which one can read and understand scripture, as there are multiple means through which one can un read and understand any piece of literature, or indeed any ideology for that matter. The problem that I have with Sam's reading is that I don't find it to be all that different than the fundamentalist's way of reading the Bible. We, in this room, laugh and mock, as frankly we should, uh, those who read the Bible so literally that they believe that the earth is 6,000 years old, that it was created in six 24-hour periods, etc., etc. And yet if we're going to laugh at that kind of literalist reading, then we have to also laugh at the kind of literalist reading that looks at the Bible's, oh, you know, discussions about, say, slavery or discussions about homosexuality, things that are so deeply a part of the cultural context in which the Bible arose. And yet those people who I think so often, you know, are, are critics of not just religion, but of, but in particular of the Bible, or really of any kind of scripture, uh, read those those uh, passages in the same literalist sense as any fundamentalist reads them. The true, I think, test for how one goes about not just reading scripture, but understanding scripture, is recognizing not just the historical context of it, the social context of it, but also recognizing that what you are reading is, as I mentioned, a description of a sacred history, a description not of facts and events. Indeed, no uh, gospel writer, in fact, no evangelist, no writer of any scripture in any way thought or believed himself to be writing what we now in the 21st century refer to as history. They were writing about the numinous uh, experience, the encounter uh, with the divine, however that encounter is, is understood. We as intelligent, you know, 21st century modernist readers have to have, I think, a much more sophisticated uh, understanding of these scriptures and to read them uh, within, you know, the sort of poetic and allegorical and cultural and, and, and historical context. Otherwise, we should be laughed at too. Um, I, I'm trying. I, I'm going mean, to, uh, I, I think our conversation I'm doing is inevitably best. torqued by the fact that in our world today, there are some very dangerous people, there's some very radical people. That's true of Christian fundamentalism <clears throat> as well as Islamic fundamentalism. And we'll get to those uh, more troubling and uns unsettling conversations. But there's a question that kept uh, uh, occurring to me as I read Sam's books. Uh, Reza and I uh, have a, a commonality in our approach to religion in that I, I hope I'm correctly characterizing you, your, your motives that we're fascinated by where these texts come from and what uh, what these texts mean, what they meant, how they have come to mean. Uh, and there's a richness and even a sense of delight about uh, the study and contemplation of, of religious traditions and texts. Uh, Sam, you're, you didn't seem to find anything to like about religion or anything even faintly redeeming about uh, the religious project. A am I overstating? Well, yeah, I think it's a matter of emphasis. I mean, I have certainly have not emphasized what I like about the Bible uh, in my writing, <laughs> though I mean, it's not without its uh, joys. I mean, there's some very good writing in there, and there's some, some rather uh, terrifying barbarism in there that is advocated not as allegory, but as, as prescriptions for how to live. Uh, and I think that's undeniable. Uh, many of these prescriptions have have lost their shelf life. I mean, it's, the Bible, on balance, tells us to keep slaves. It tells us how to keep slaves. Now, this is a an embarrassment. Uh, I think a rather fatal embarrassment to anyone who would then say the Bible is a, is the best book of moral wisdom humanity has ever had. Uh, it's not the best book because it gets the question of slavery wrong. Uh, and slavery is perhaps the easiest and one of the most consequential moral problems we've ever had to face as a civilization. Uh, but uh, the basic point here is that 
for me that is so troubling is that there is this claim being made by most religious people most of the time that one of their books is not an ordinary book. One of their books is a magic book. Uh, that it seems to be believed that the contents of the Bible or the contents of the Quran are so, are so uh, impeccable, so, so prescient of our needs as a species that they could not possibly have been written by human beings. Uh, this is this is patently absurd when you read the books. I mean, this is, just compare for a moment uh, another human project. Uh, Isaac Newton went into to isolation in the year 1665 to to escape the plague. He spent 18 months uh, working in his garret, and at the end of that time, he had invented calculus. He had invented the field of optics. He had discovered the, the, the universal law of gravitation and the, the laws of motion. Uh, and he came out and delivered this. And, and, and scientists uh, in almost any field agree that this is probably the most startling use of human intelligence in the history of human intelligence. And yet no one for a moment is tempted to believe that God had to help him with this. He, he was not, this was not under the dictation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, we know that Newton was a thoroughly unpleasant, megalomaniacal, neurotic man. Uh, and, and we have superseded his insights to some significant degree, but it took 200 years of continuous ingenuity on the part of the, some of the smartest people who have ever lived to do this. I, you know, I, I, I say this rather often, we could improve the Bible in five seconds. Uh, and that's 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 problematic for the claim that it is the best book really on any subject. I, I, I'm going to stand on a point of personal privilege because I can quote myself on this subject. Because Isaac Newton, uh, as I discovered in my researches into the book of Revelation, was an ardent student and expositor on Revelation, one of the great yeah. mystical books of the Bible and of that enterprise uh, Voltaire said that uh, Newton's writings on Revelation were his consolation to mankind for his exceeding superiority in all other fields right, of endeavor. Right. And I offer that merely to say that uh, uh, Newton is the single best example that the scientific mind can coexist with the mystical mind, uh, including uh, the mind of a credulous reader of the Bible. Well, it's, it's a curious coexistence. We might come back to that topic because I think it's I think it's the coexistence of partition, not the coexistence of, of mutual support. Integration. Yeah. Let's, let's definitely get back to that later on. I like that. Um, I don't know. I, I find something. I find something intellectually dishonest about talking about um, the morality of the Bible uh, of a text written 3,000 years ago that seems to endorse slavery. An idea that had absolutely no moral quality to it whatsoever 3,000 years ago. There's a problem, I think, by, by you know, citing something like that and then therefore rejecting the entire text or any aspect of morality that, that it may or may not uh, uh, prescribe that does or does not coincide with our 21st century conception of what, what morality may be. Um, by that argument, well, the Quran actually uh, forbids slavery, so therefore the Quran is a more moral text than, than the Bible? Of course not. And certainly the New Testament, uh, as our own abolitionists in this country had argued for, for decades and decades. The New Testament seems to go against the, uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament about you know, its views on, on slavery and the, and the uses of slavery. But nevertheless, I think that to, to again, to read scripture in this way is, is to fundamentally misunderstand the very point of scripture. The easiest thing in the world to do is to go through the history of, of scriptures, regardless of what religion you're talking about, and find offensive, uh, despicable uh, you know, aspects in, in there. Uh, but I don't think that it takes sort of a, a sophisticated leap of logic to then use those ex examples to then decry the entire history of religions altogether. I don't really understand this, this jump at all. Um, and again, to, to sort of essentially reject the whole of the Bible, all 60 some odd books of it, um, based well, on... Well, I don't. I, I, if I could just respond to that. I actually don't. Uh, 
Um, first of all, you're mistaken on in terms of the, the New Testament's treatment of, of slavery. Uh, Paul comes forward and says that uh, slaves should serve their masters well and serve their Christian masters especially well so as to partake of their in, in their holiness. Uh, and the the while the abolitionists could cherry pick their favorite lines of the Bible that seem to, to uh, proscribe slavery, there's no question that the slaveholders of the South knew they were on the winning side of a theological argument and they, they made much of it. And in fact, the Muslims helped them along with, with uh, their interpretation of the curse of, of Ham, which, which seemed to justify uh, black African slavery per se for, for a thousand years. Um, so the, the record is, uh, of the, his, the, the religious r record uh, and its effect on slavery is, is not a, a, a noble one. But I don't reject the good parts in the Bible. I mean, the, the, the point is we have a human conversation which has evolved over thousands of years of recorded history, and we can either locate ourselves in the 21st century, availing ourselves of all of the tools that we've acquired, all of the, the brilliant insights, some of which come from our religious traditions. But I think the golden rule is, is almost as good as we have as a, a, an, a moral algorithm. Um, it's, it's not original to Jesus, but it's, it's perhaps it's best expressed in the Bible. Um, it, is, it captures our intuitions of what it is to be, to, to be ethical uh, in, in so many respects. And so we can, the one thing to point out is that how is it that we find wisdom in Scripture? We find it based on our own ethical intuitions. I mean, you go, you go to the Bible, you read in Deuteronomy, it says, if your bride is not a virgin on, on your wedding night, you should stone her to death on her father's doorstep. You recognize, oh, that's at best, at, at the very, at very least impractical, uh, <laughs> probably wrong, um, uh, doesn't feel good. So you, you flip the page and then you find something like the Beatitudes and, and that strikes you as, ah, this is the wisdom of, of uh, Christianity, say. Uh, that, is, that is something, you, you are the guarantor of the morality you are finding in Scripture. But Sam, as, wouldn't you concede that uh, putting aside the radical fringe, that most people read Scripture in precisely the way you prescribe? They pick and choose. They respond to those things which are exalting and elevating, mm -hmm. and they reject those things which are antique or archaic or, 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 or dangerous. Well, not, Most people. Not nearly enough, and I think not, especially not enough in the Muslim tradition. I think we have uh, in Christianity and Judaism, first of all, it must be conceded that there are no books in Scripture more heinous than the, the, the books in the Hebrew Bible, like Deuteronomy and Exodus and Second Samuel. I mean, these, these are the books where it is just spelled out ad nauseum when you should kill people for, for theological offenses. Um, and if you f follow those prescriptions, you would have very much a, a world like we witnessed under the Taliban in Afghanistan with people having their heads cut off at, at halftime in a soccer match for, for adultery. Uh, but so even fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews can't read their scripture altogether literally now. Uh, that's because of, of hundreds of years of colliding with modernity and secular progress and, and scientific progress. And we're not burning witches on street corners uh, anymore, and that's a good thing. But we did it for five long centuries. And as Reza knows, in most of the Muslim world, uh, you have taken your life in your hands if you uh, declare yourself an apostate. I mean, even in Afghanistan, where we invaded and gave them a constitution, apostasy is still punishable by death, and we still have to smuggle out that one guy who, who became a Christian on CNN and, and you know, had to be spirited away to Italy with a, with a diagnosis of mental illness to save his life in that country. Well, let me this again goes, I think, to a fundamental problem um, with this whole line of argument. Um, of course, Afghanistan is one of the least socially, politically, economically developed countries on the planet. And there are one and a half billion Muslims in the world, uh, the vast, vast majority of whom do not live in the traditional Arab and Muslim world in, in the Middle East. And indeed, there are more Muslims in the deserts of sub-Saharan Africa than there are people in the entire Arab world. Um, so those kinds of generalities, I think, ba particularly generalities based on anecdotal evidence, are things that I would assume that a scientific mind should not uh, dwell upon. Um, 
I will say one quick thing. I think you're misrepresenting Paul's comments. What he said about Timothy was, and this is why the abolitionists use it, is that masters should be kind to their slaves. Uh, slaves should obey their masters. Mm -hmm. But the ideal is for masters to free their slaves. Now, again, we can sort of, with our you know, sense of morality, look back upon that and say, well, that's still a heinous idea. But we don't reject Huckleberry Finn because it uses the word nigger, do we? And yet we can reject the the Gospels based on the morality of of two thousand years ago. I just I really no, nobody, don't see how nobody's this is rejecting a, them as literature. I mean, I'm not recommending that you reject them as literature. If no, you not read as literature. It like no, Huck certainly, Finn. certainly not as literature. But but I but I do have a problem. I think with this notion that, you know. I, I think that there's something disingenuous about this idea that you're that you're presenting that your view of the scripture is such that you have respect for those sections that fit your sense of morality, but you reject those sections that that not that again, I think as Jonathan mentioned, that's I think what most people, most the vast majority of religious people feel the same way about scriptures. Um, and there are certainly examples that we can look up, look at uh, of people who do have this very fundamentalist, literalist interpretation of scripture. And we certainly have examples, plenty of them, of, of people who believe that their scripture is correct and other scriptures are not. As you said, that this fundamental belief that one of these scriptures in the history of, of religions is correct and the rest are wrong. But again, I don't understand why this notion that there are there's some kind of, uh, that, that dogmas can be irreconcilable has anything to do with the existence of God or the question of the existence of God. That, that's, I think, where, where I'm, I, I'm fundamentally sort of confused by that argument. I, I want to say that I'm, I'm really delighted that a panel consisting of a Muslim, a Jew, and an atheist can uh, construe Paul's letter to Timothy, and I'm going to weigh in as well. Uh, uh, Paul, like all the first Christians, including Jesus, was utterly convinced that we did not have to worry about the problem of slavery or any other human problem because it was all going to come to an end in his lifetime. And Paul famously said, you must look to uh, your spiritual rebirth in Christ Jesus where there will be neither man nor woman, Greek nor Jew, bond nor free. He felt that the institution of slavery would solve itself because the whole world was going to go to uh, it would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, let me move us to this, uh, what I think of as the 800-pound gorilla of religious discourse. We cannot, in our world today, discuss religion without confronting the phenomenon of uh, militant Islam. Uh, and, I, and by way of introduction, I want to say that uh, not long ago, uh, I was uh, privileged to be on a radio panel uh, with Andrew Sullivan and with Sam. Um, I was broadcasting from uh, Col Coliseum Books in, in New York. And the only thing we could agree on, the three of us, as I recollect it, was that uh, Judaism and Christianity had had its reformation. And that's why they were tempered. Uh, that uh, Islam had not yet had its uh, reformation, and that's why uh, it posed the kinds of threats that we perceive it to pose. Uh, I was fascinated to read uh, uh, Reza's comments on precisely this issue, and if you'll permit me, I would like to read a, a bit from Reza's book and then from Sam's. And Reza, I hope I've gone, it's a longish quote, I hope I've gone long enough, you know, <laughs> to pick up the crucial sentence. I'll let you know. Um, and I, and I, I must say, I found this passage absolutely mind-opening. Uh, this from Reza's book. Muslim men and women, first worlders and third worlders, gay and straight, extremists and moderates, militants and pacifists, clerics and lay people are actively reinterpreting Islam according to their own changing needs. That sentence alone is something to ponder. By doing so, they are not only redefining Islam by taking its interpretation out of the iron grip of clerical institutions, they are shaping the future of this rapidly expanding and deeply fractured face. Jihadists like Osama bin Laden must be understood as products of, not counters to, the Islamic reformation. Indeed, bin Laden joins a long and unsavory list of militant Puritans, 
whether Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or Hindu, who consider themselves and their individual followers to be the only true believers and all others to be hypocrites, imposters, and apostates who must be convinced of their folly or abandoned to their horrible fates. It may be too early to know who will write the next chapter of Islam's story, but it is not too early to recognize who will ultimately win the war between reform and counter-reform. The cleansing is inevitable and the tide of reform cannot be stopped. The Islamic Revo Reformation is already here. We are all living in it. And I would pair that with a passage from Sam's book, and this, this is where I am afraid the arc, uh, the sparks will fly. Uh, the idea that Islam is a peaceful religion hijacked by extremists is a fantasy. And it is now a particularly dangerous fantasy for Muslims to indulge. It is now a truism in foreign policy circles that real reform in the Muslim world cannot be imposed from the outside. But it is important to recognize why this is so. It is so because most Muslims are utterly deranged by their religious faith. Muslims tend to view questions of public policy and global conflict in terms of their affiliation with Islam and Muslims who don't view the world in these terms risk being branded as apostates and killed by other Muslims. Uh, these are two very different diametrically opposed perceptions of the uh, Muslim world. And I, I wonder if there's well, any way we can reconcile this. I, th I, think, I think Sam's view is perfectly legitimate if your research tools are Fox News. Um, <laughs> I think it, 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 it indicates a I, no, I mean that serious. I think it indicates a profoundly unsophisticated view, not just of Islamic history uh, and the social and cultural issues that are taking place within Islam, but it, I think it indicates a profoundly unsophisticated view of what religion is, period. Um, it is very easy, again, I mean, the easiest thing in the world is to write a book called, you know, The Problem with Religion. Uh, all you have to do is turn your television on. Um, it's not it's not interesting it's not a unique argument but I think that to truly understand the role that religion is playing in this socio-political conflicts that are taking place in the world and what religion provides to those conflicts uh, requires a, a far more sophisticated look let, let me let me let me just say this it was, I, I found it very gratifying that we began this discussion this evening, in fact, uh, by uh, talking about Hrant um, Dink, Dink uh, who, of course, was murdered by an ultranationalist. Had Hrant Dink been murdered by uh, an Islamist, of course, we would have begun by saying, aha, yet another example of the problem with Islam. Indeed, the problem with religion, is, as Sam's book and the end of faith talks about if if you know religious if religion is causing people to to kill other people, then the problem is religion. Well. By that logic, then, the, the murder of Hrant Dijk should be blamed on nationalism. Indeed, the, the great, the, the sort of the most wicked acts of the 20th century are all a, a result not of religious ideologies, but essentially secular ideologies. We would have to uh, blame nationalism for the fascist regimes uh, of the 20th century. We would have to blame uh, socialism for, for, for the Nazis. We would have to blame uh, secularism for, for Mao's cultural revolution, which of course exterminated almost every last uh, Buddhist pr uh, monk and, and nun. Uh, we would have to blame communism for Stalinism. Um, or for the, and for that matter, we would have to blame science for uh, whatever horrors were, were, were created in, in its names for Hitler's eugenics experience. Now, uh, of course, Sam will say, but that's not true. Those are bastardizations of, of science. They're, they're a betrayal of the ideals uh, of science. It's, it's what happens when science becomes ideologized or dogmatized. Well, fine, I totally agree with that. But if you're going to excuse these other ideologies, uh, if you're going to not blame them for the horrors committed in their names, uh, when it's very easy to understand how nationalism can result in the murder of, of someone like a Turkish Armenian in, in Turkey, 
then you have to be a little bit more sophisticated about a knee-jerk blame of religion for whatever acts of violence are caused in the, religious, in, in the name of religion. We have a tendency in these kinds of comparisons to essentially uh, uh, compare the, 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 the best ideals of one thing, say science, with the worst ideals of another thing, religion. Uh, you know, bad science is, is still science, just as bad religion is still religion. So I think that, uh, that those kinds of sort of false connections, the, the comparison of sort of the legacy of one ideology with the legacy of another one, I think there, there has to be a little bit more sophistication in, which, in, in the ways that we, that we make that kind of comparison. Hmm. Well, let me see if I can clarify my view here, because I actually don't think you and I are as far apart on this particular issue as, as it as it seems. Um, I think what is interesting about my criticism of religion is not that you can turn on the television on really any channel, not just Fox, um, and see that some significant subset of the Muslim world is motivated on the basis of their theology <clears throat> to behave in ways that would, ways that would otherwise be unthinkable. Um, I mean, there, you know, it takes some ID, ideas to get someone who has economic opportunity, who has the benefit of an education, who has not been molested by occupying powers, and get him to think that the best use of his time is to hijack a plane and hit the wall at 400 miles an hour. I mean, this is, if this were coming, if this kind of violence were coming, by and large, from the poorest of the poor, the most desperate, the most uh, abused, uh, then those variables would be far more salient, but it's not. And uh, there are a variety of, uh, of studies that, that uh, bear this out. Um, but what is interesting to me is the way in which your sophistication, your willingness to have a conception of religion and a conception of faith that is, that is almost infinitely elastic, that is compatible with kind of any mode of discourse, a, a conception which never allows us to call a spade a spade, um, is giving shelter to this kind of uh, religious literalism. I, I, I have never for a moment believed, and I have never argued, that all bad things, all conflict, comes out of religion. Uh, I don't even know if most does. I, I think probably most uh, wars have been fought for reasons other than, than uh, religious ideology. But the, the larger issue is dogmatism. The larger issue is belief without sufficient evidence, belief that is uh, intrinsically divisive because it is immune to criticism, it is immune to the normal uh, tests of conversation, tests of reasonableness, and these beliefs that divide us into these separate moral communities where we have Christians against Muslims against Jews or blacks against whites or one nation against another nation based on nationalism. I think nationalism can be incredibly corrosive of everything we want to encourage in civilization. Uh, dogmatism and ideology immune to criticism is a problem. The problem, however, is that only in religion do we put a veneer of sanctity over dogmatism and call it faith, call it, 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 and once called faith, it becomes a, a apparently necessary and redeeming and precious part of the human experience. I don't think it is, and I think we can have our ethics and have our spiritual experience, uh, e indeed even become mystics, without ever presupposing anything on insufficient evidence and without ever lying to ourselves and other human beings about what we know to be true. Sam, I want to uh, hold you to a, a, a close scrutiny of this phrase, which I think is a real shocker, mm. and, and, and you must have intended it to be a shocker. Most Muslims are utterly, utterly deranged by their religious faith. I've even heard you back off a little bit. Now uh, you went from most to some significant subset. Well, uh, no, but, I, okay, but, uh, let, me, but, let me just make it clear. I'm not yeah. backing off of that because... Uh, utterly deranged by their, I, mean, I, I set the bar rather low for utter derangement. Um, I mean, my, by my, lay, my, my, my life's thinking that the Quran is the best book ever written on any subject, really, is getting you pretty close to derangement. Thinking that it is, it, that someone should be killed for criticizing it 
or that, that, that it's a real problem that cartoonists caricature the, the Prophet Muhammad and they, you know, they should be um, uh, kidnapped, uh, that, that this is the kind of, these, the tr treading upon the sanctities of the religion is a, is a real social problem uh, that demands more energy uh, in its criticism than uh, suicide bombing. Uh, that, I think, is a kind of derangement that is immensely widespread, and we shouldn't minimize it. The thing, however, where the, the, the thing I don't know, and which uh, is a place where I think Reza and I will, will actually have a meeting of the minds, is I don't know. I mean, it's, it's perfectly clear to me that my style of conversation is not what can be broadcast to the Muslim world to change people's minds. I mean, that is your job. You are much better suited for that job. And I would agree with you that in order to empower the moderates of the Muslim world, drawing cartoons of the prophet and, and writing paragraphs of the sort I've written is not a strategy. Um, I'm not a diplomat. And uh, I don't know. but. What's troubling me is I don't know where the line is between encouraging moderation, representing what Islam could be. You know, Islam could be a religion of peace, perhaps. Jihad could be just an inner spiritual struggle and have nothing to do with holy war. Uh, indeed, that we have to raise a generation of Muslims who believe uh, those things. Uh, but pretending that it is already is problematic because it isn't for so many millions of Muslims. And I, it may be that, that if you pretend hard enough, in fact, you become what you pretend to be. And maybe that's, maybe that's part of the process. But uh, I think we have to admit to ourselves that we are confronting the behavior of a death cult among millions and millions of Muslims, not 10,000 who went to training camps in Afghanistan. Um, we are, we are confronting an endorsement of this kind of behavior and a, a reflexive political solidarity where Muslims side with other Muslims, no matter how sociopathic their behavior, simply because there are other Muslims. Uh, we can't deny the problem while trying to encourage a more benign face of the religion. I, I mean, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, Sam, and, and, I, and I certainly, as we've talked in, in our many other conversations, you know, do respect your, your you know, uh, intellectualism. Um, but there's a reason why I don't write books about neuroscience, because I don't have an expertise in neuroscience. I write books about what's going on in the Muslim world because I have an expertise in what's going on in the Muslim world. I actually travel through the Muslim world. I study the Muslim world. I understand the conversations that are taking place. And so I, I feel like, in a sense, <clears throat> I'm in a better position to sort of make judgments about what's, what sort of socio or religious or political developments are, are taking place within this people of, you know, one and a half billion uh, a, a number. Um, Statements like there are millions of Muslims who, you know, have this sort of death cult are profoundly inaccurate mm. and are based on nothing except your sort of general impression of a region and of a religion that you have a very surface understanding of. Well, it's not, for instance, in the end of faith. I cite these Pew polls that were done in nine Muslim countries, actually not the most radicalized. I and mean, the most radicalized countries wouldn't let the polling be done. But even in, even in Turkey, uh, the, you know, the Muslim success story uh, on many fronts, the level of support for suicide bombing against non-combatants in defense of the faith was shocking. I mean, you, get, you just run the numbers. When 77% when of people in Lebanon say that it is justified, that's, you know, it's not a minority. It's not even close to a minority. In, e even if it were only 5% of the Muslim world that was radicalized by my lights, that is still a problem we have to talk about soberly. I mean, this is that we're still, we're talking about 75 million people. Certainly, and I don't think anybody would, would say that, you know, that's not a conversation that we need to talk about. But, but, but it's, but but it's a your... civilizational problem that, now, that, that is what, not amenable to simply I don't know saying what, that, that Islam is a religion of peace. I don't understand what, what Islamic civilization means. I mean, I don't... No, I'm, I'm, not what, talk, what I'm talking is, about our, this global civilization. Oh, I see. Um, the, I, I think, look, the, 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 the issue here, of, of course, 
as you mentioned before, is how do you go about addressing a very serious, serious problem that is taking place, not just in the Muslim world, but throughout the world. I mean, we, the, both of those comments that, that the difference between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is that Judaism and Christianity have gone through some sort of reform and so that it's tempered its, its uh, you know, violent uh, uh, aspects and Islam hasn't. Both of those statements are false. Uh, I don't find any kind of tempering in the extremism with which Christianity or Judaism deals with the issue. The soul, or not soul, but certainly the most significant factor in the way that one understands one's religion, the way one interprets one's religion, is not what the religion itself, it's your social context. So we apparently forgot about the 80s and the, the movement of liberation theology in Latin America, a very Catholic, deeply, deeply Christian conception of Jesus as warrior in which priests themselves were forced to take up arms in the name of the liberator Jesus um, and, and you know, murder op op opponents in, in that sense. Um, very few people, I think, would have blamed that, blamed Catholicism or Christianity uh, uh, upon those things. We talk about the social political structure of a region when we deal with the conflicts that arise out of that region. So, th again, from our position here in the United States, 70 percent, what, 80 percent Christian, something, something to that effect, uh, an incredibly affluent society, a, a, if you're a Christian living in, uh, let's say, Los Angeles, your idea of who Jesus is, of what Jesus means, is profoundly different than if you're a Christian living in the hills of Guatemala. If you're a Muslim living in Los Angeles, your conception of Islam as a religion of peace, as a religion that, that prescribes you know, peacefulness and tolerance and pluralism, that's going to be vastly different than if you're a Muslim living in a garbage heap in Gaza. So it's not just simply verbal sophistry to say that there are much more significant aspects that define one's political or social views that lead one to even acts of violence than just merely religion. Religion does not explain solely why someone decides to strap a bomb to themselves and, and, you know, and kill combatants or non-combatants, however it would be. And it's, a, I think, a profoundly simplistic way of thinking about not just religion, but about these social conflicts themselves. Reza, I'd, I'd like to focus you on, on, on one of the implications of what you're saying. Uh, one of the most remarkable phenomena of recent history has been the rapprochement between Israel and the PLO, which was formerly vilified uh, as, as a satanic force in, in the world, as terrorists and murderers. And suddenly, by comparison with Hamas, PLO seems like a very desirable partner for peace uh, to the extent that uh, Israel is, is entertaining, uh, releasing men that they put in jail for terrorist acts so that they can turn uh, uh, their weapons against Hamas. And, and the reason is that with PLO, uh, an organization with nationalist aspirations, one can negotiate a state and the state will satisfy their demands. Uh, with Hamas, which uh, uh, has a much more expansive cosmic view of the struggle, there is no basis for a, a negotiated peace. Is that not an example of where injecting religion into a political conflict raises the stakes? That's a, a, a phrase. One of many, many examples. I would say, however, that it's important to recognize that the Israelis reached out and negotiated with the PLO long before Hamas was a serious organization of any kind. Uh, and not, again, because they thought, well, the PLO is better than Hamas. It's because the social aspects changed was suddenly it was it was politically expedient in order to negotiate with with uh, with the PLO and so suddenly the the terminology of them as a death squad of, of suicide bombers or of fanatics that could not be talked to those that kind of rhetoric fluttered away um, so I, I mean to me that that sort of in in many ways uh, um, strengthens what I'm what I'm talking about when I say that you know we we cannot in any way think of religion as existing solely in a vacuum. That's what I meant yeah, by religion is I by don't, definition interpretation. I don't, I don't. But again, if the poorest, most molested people were by and large the jihadists, 
and the engineers and the architects and the doctors, the people who had a benefit of, of uh, the good life, were disproportionately moderate, then this analysis of yours would make some sense. But we have someone like uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, right? A surgeon. He comes from one of the most respected families in Egypt. He's got doctors and judges and pharmacists, as far as the eye can see. Um, he is not an exception. He is not, if you correct for literacy in the Muslim world, support for suicide bombing goes up. I mean, this is the, the most radicalized people uh, are not the people who, in particular, well, you can see this in microcosm when you actually look at the biographies of the 19 hijackers. These were all college educated. Many of them had PhDs. I mean, it's just not the religion really is separable uh, as the most important va variable. And what is actually right on the surface to be seen is that these people are telling us what is motivating them. The jihadis are talking all day long about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise, the, the, the just the the horrors of living in proximity with the infidels, the, the desecration of the Muslim holy sites by the proximity of, of uh, uh, infidel troops on the ground. I mean, this is, you know, Osama bin Laden tells us what motivates him. He's telling us why he's not living in Paris and dating models with his inheritance. I mean, he's, he, he is being quite articulate, ad nauseum. Um, and so to deny the role that religion is playing, I would never for a moment say that, that there are not poor, mistreated people driven to extremis uh, and to extreme violence for reasons other than religion. Of course, that happens. But this is a, a, this is a separable component, which we have rendered, by the terms of our discourse, by our emotional attachment to it, immune to criticism. It is taboo to say that the Quran is bogus as a, as a document that, that describes the history of, of uh, uh, the evolution of our species as a document that makes really cogent prescriptions about how to live in the, in the 21st century, as is the Bible. Uh, almost entirely bogus if you're going to take it as a, as a text to live by. Um, it is taboo to say that. You could not possibly get elected in this country if you even openly doubted whether or not there was a creator God listening to, to the prayers of your constituents. I mean, this is the world we are living in, and it's... Uh, well, I, Sam, I, I, I just I have to say, I'm not sure what world you're living in, but uh, if it were taboo to say those things, and I don't think you would have sold half a million copies of your book. Half a million um, copies is, is the 25 million copies of The Purpose Driven Life being sold. I mean, it's, it, it <laughs> well, is a, it is those, a are, those are vastly different books and vastly different audiences. Yes. But I think, look, Zawahiri, and this is, and I'm so glad that you brought this up, because Zawahiri wasn't a jihadist until he was placed in the sed dank and sadistic prisons of Egypt and tortured. And then when he came out, then he became a jihadist. Well, that's actually I had not no true. way. No, it's absolutely true. Well, he was a I, member. Read the Looming member, Tower. I, he I, was a, I know Lawrence Wright. We've talked about this. He's, he himself, uh, Zawahiri, was, of course, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. But the Muslim Brotherhood is not a jihadist organization. Close and enough, to, by my lights. That is that, again, indicates the profound unsophistication that you have about this region, to think that there is a connection between the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and Al-Qaeda, that they are exactly the same thing. I'm not saying they're the same thing, but or that they're close the, ideology, the ideology is so close in its, in its divisiveness. You, you in could its... not be more wrong in that okay, case. Well, we've read and the again, same book. And again, this know. is not the issue. The issue isn't that poor people become suicide bombers. Everybody knows that that's not true. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that... And you read bin Laden, his, his justifications for, for the terrorist acts are not religious justifications. They're, They're not? No, not, not at all. He says very clearly, it's because of Palestine. It's because of troops in Saudi Arabia. It's because of now what's going on in Iraq. Now, these, we can say, are are false constructs, that he doesn't really mean these things, and certainly well, he's no, never no, done no, anything no, to no, help. But they're theological issues. grievances. No, they're not, and that is exactly where I think you're misunderstanding what's happening. They're social grievances, they are political grievances, they are economic grievances, and like everybody on earth, they are framed in the language of religion. You know, we stand here... In the United States, one of the most religious countries in the world, as Sam, you, you certainly know, a country in which we are perfectly comfortable 
when our politicians, even those that are nominally religious, use the most distinct religious language to talk about purely social or economic or political issues, it's perfectly normal for us because, of course, we understand that that kind of language is the language that holds the most currency with the masses. We are, of course, embroiled in a war between good and evil, are we not? I mean, again, but somehow when a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt uh, uses the same kind of religious language to talk about his economic agenda, we immediately label it as theocratic or Islamist or fundamentalist in some way. There are people who have, legitimately or not, very serious grievances with what they see as a, or how they understand a, a legitimate resistance to what they uh, view as an attack upon their very identities. And of course, identity goes far deeper than just simply cultural or social or national or religious. It's a combination of those things. And who have used the language of religion to give voice to that opposition, to give voice to that resistance in very extreme and very unusual cases that identity, that, that, that attack on an identity, that language leads to horrific acts of violence. But to sort of reduce it to, well, it's, you know, it's not about you know, being poor or being about rich, that you know, he was a doctor and he became a jihadist, therefore you know, it must have been religion that, that uh, influenced him to do it and not his, his you know, poverty or for any situation. I, again, I think that, that that's a real, um, it's a real sort of oversimplification of a, of a very complex issue that has much more to do with one's identity than it does to, with one's faith. Let, let me pause our conversation for a moment to preview that we'll have a bit more of our conversation and then we'll be going to the audience in the next couple of minutes uh, so you can prepare your questions. I also feel, I, I, I want to point out to the audience that there was a very telling moment in the writer's life that just uh, passed before your eyes, which is that uh, when Reza and I meet an author who sold 500,000 copies, we're pretty damn impressed. But when you've sold 500,000 copies, you're looking at 25 million as a price. <laughs> Uh, Sam, I'd like to ask you uh, how you can reconcile the uh, statements, the generalizations that you, you feel comfortable in making about is Islam and the Islamic world when we are confronted every night, hammered every night, by the reality that the problem in Iraq mm -hmm. is the problem that within an Islamic nation there are Sunni Muslims fighting Shiite Muslims and then there are Kurdish Muslims we're fighting both of them. Right. Uh, I mean, are, and, and in this I'm joining Reza in imploring you, is there not more diversity and pluralism in the Islamic world than perhaps you're giving it credit for? Yeah, and nobody is suffering from the diversity in the Islamic world more than Muslims. I mean, we have in Iraq right now Shia and Sunni drilling holes into each other's brains with power tools in the suburbs of Baghdad uh, people, I would argue, who would not otherwise be engaged in this behavior but for their incompatible religious identities. I mean, they are, they are caught in a blood feud which has all of the character of, of non-religious blood feuds. I mean, vendetta, you, it goes back for, for centuries. Uh, it, no doubt we stirred up this hornet's nest with our intrusion there, which I think has been hideous and... and uh, uh, utterly misconceived uh, and misapplied, um, as I think we could probably all agree. Um, but the reality is, is that if Iraq were all Sunni and there was no religious difference to be exploited by this, uh, this crucible that we have, have uh, placed these people in, um, I don't think you would have the same character of violence. It is, it, they have def defined the Sunni especially have defined the Shia as apostates, and a, a, across that gulf, they have uh, managed to completely dehumanize them. And it has, it has, this is now spiraling out of control. It, the, the, if you want to step back from it, the, the real issue is tribalism. The real issue is us-them thinking. The real issue is instrumental violence where you don't really care to kill the person who killed your son. You'll just kill one of his sons, or you'll just kill someone who's a part of the same group. That kind of, of breakdown of, uh, 
of empathy, ultimately, is enabled massively by the fact that we have these competing religious identities in the world. Your explanation of what's going on in Iraq does not in any way explain why the Kurds who are Sunni are killing and fighting other Sunni Kurds. It doesn't explain why in southern Iraq, Shia militias, the Badr Brigade and the Mahdi army, are killing each other. And it's, a, I think, again, a fundamental misunderstanding of why these groups are fighting each other. Uh, and and it, it, it's, it, it's as simple as simply well, Let's reading. make it very, very simple then. The, the, the problem in the Middle East, imagine the problem in the Middle East without religion. I mean, just how good a thing is it that the Jews think that the creator of the universe promised them a certain strip of desert on the Mediterranean? I mean, how, how is that having let any me, consequence me, in our world? Let me ask world? you a question. Do you believe, do you believe that the lack of a, a two-state solution and peace in Palestine uh, is the result of the Jewish government believing that God gave them that land and so they won't, they won't deny and, it? And I have to I join mean, in here and say who actually believes that, that, that the men and women who created the modern state of Israel were atheists who believed that if they stayed in Europe, the Jewish people would be murdered, then and they, they were turned right. out yes. to be right. They were not religious Jews. They were condemned as apostates by the religious and Jews. And indeed, the ultra-Orthodox religious yeah. Jews I mean, don't was, believe. Okay, in but the Zionist that, project but however, but was... Actually, to, to, to misunderstand the intent of my remark, I mean, I, I, I think the, the history of anti-Semitism is the history of the religious vilification of Jews, which had the consequence of the virtual extermination of the Jews in Europe, which then gave a real justification well, to the state well, of Israel. All I would say is it, it gets my blood up to hear that, that phrase, what if the uh, Jews had not believed that this little strip of land had been given to them by God, uh, as if to say this was a, a, a religious... No. Uh, crusade by Jews. I, it was no, not, no, it I was take a, those caveats, but, but yeah. what do you think would happen if we woke up tomorrow with the brilliant idea that we're just going to end the problem in the Middle East by giving the Jews British Columbia? Okay. <laughs> would they accept it? That was it? tried. That was okay. tried. Right, okay. Actually, with Ghana. I'm now, Uganda. Now, now, well, I, I, why not accept that? that uh, well, I have trade. to concede this point to you, which is that in these very, and, and then I'm going to go to the audience, in these very discouraging times about, uh, where the prospects of peace in the Middle East are so uh, dismal, uh, if, you, if you play that thought game, what if the Jews were magically removed from uh, Israel, would that solve the problem of the Islamic world or the problem between the Islamic world and the West? And I think you'd have to conclude not at all. Not, yeah, not, not it, it, wouldn't say it would solve the problem between the Jews and their neighbors. I mean, the reason why they can't all live happily together on that land is because Judaism and, and Islam uh, are... are hostile to one another on those on that sanctified ground. I mean, if the Jews left, they, they would not be attacked by the Canadians. Uh, Actually, nine, before 1948, of course, there were tens of thousands of Jews living alongside, you know, their, their Arab neighbors without any problem at all. Again, to and, talk and about... the Arab world. Absolutely. Well, no, talk, no, it, without any problem at all is, I, mean, I list the years of pogroms against Jews in all of those relevant countries. In Palestine? I'm, I'm referring to Palestine, but... Yeah, but the, the in point, all the, in, throughout the Arab world. The point that I'm making is that by talking about this, this conflict as a religious conflict, as you are explicitly doing, mm -hmm. you are essentially doing the same thing that the extremists are doing, and that is by overlaying this religious significance upon this that turns an earthly conflict into a cosmic battle, a battle for identity, a battle for who you are as a human being versus who the other is. Let's play a different thought game. Instead of let's remove the, the Jews from, from Israel, let's play the thought game in which we stop thinking about this as a Jewish Muslim issue because it's not and start thinking about it as a Palestinian Israeli issue, which it is. Um, and those, you know, certainly, you know, there, there's a, the, the religious sort of connotations about it. There's no question that the most, you know, ultra conservative Jews and, and ultra conservative Muslims in that region have a very cosmic conception of what is taking place there. Mm. But we cannot fall into the same trap by simply swallowing that conception of it and legitimizing it by, by sort of discussing it as though that truly is the problem. This is an inherent Muslim Jewish problem. It's not. No, no. The problem is that so many people believe that it is. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm concerned with is the, the, the logical and behavioral consequences of beliefs. If you Are believe, you one of those people? Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to bring our sure. portion of the conversation to a close with apologies to Sam. I want to affirm what Reza said from your lips to God's ear. Uh, I, I believe there's a microphone. I'm going to call on this young lady. I mean, it, you know, you can't be a basketball player if you can't shoot a free throw. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, you, you can't join, you know, a, a scientific sort of community if you reject the very foundation of, that, of science. I mean, of course, yeah. I don't see why that's, that's well, controversial. Well, I, I, I would just add to that that there is an insidious effort to equalize these two approaches right, that's the by point. the theory of intelligent design, which is a, because they realize that creationism has a bad odor nowadays. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, they're not comparable. And uh, whether you could enforce such a rule, I'm not sure. Well, one thing I'd like to add to that is that I'm often misconstrued as advocating that we pass laws against religious belief, that somehow we, we create some mechanism whereby we really Put, you turn down the screws on religious people. Uh, I'm not advocating that at all. I'm really advocating just new rules of conversation. I mean, ask yourself, what do we do with the astrologers? You know, I mean, how how have we managed to keep astrologers off the Supreme Court or off our medical boards or? But not out of the White House. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> it's there's always marriage, the peril of marriage, perhaps. Um, but by and large, astrologers are not acquiring vast responsibility in our society and we're not continually ambushed by the the neurosurgeon who doesn't want to perform surgery that day because Saturn is in retrograde or whatever I mean this is not happening uh, it's not happening because when someone talks with too much conviction about the, the effect of, of the planets on on human affairs uh, we begin to stop listening to them. We stop taking them seriously. They don't get promoted. There no, there's no laws involved. And I just think that that should happen when, when people begin uh, to express their certainty that Jesus is coming back in their lifetime, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Good. I mean, isn't there something to be said about their ancient text? And, and let's not emotionalize them. Let's just say, should they be viewed the same way we, we look at a lot of other philosophical works? And should we simply say, it's no longer applicable? They're not good. They're not bad. They just no longer have relevance in today's day and age. Well, I, 
I, that's an excellent question, by the way. Um, I think that there are two ways to view uh, scripture or text. Um, and first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, the entirety of human history is inextricably bound to religion. It cannot be divided. Um, or the, the conception of religion as a, as a language. And we're, we're tossing this word religion around a lot. We should figure out what we mean when we say it. Religion is the, the language through which one describes sort of the transcendence. Uh, and by transcendence, I don't mean anything more complicated than that which lies beyond our material realm, our experience of the material realm. Uh, we need a means through which we can describe this, to which we can express it to ourselves and more importantly to one another. Um, and religion provides that language. Religion is not something you believe in or you don't believe in. I, again, that I think is a misunderstanding of what religion, the function of religion, and it's a misunderstanding that is primarily uh, found amongst people of religion. Um, the the, the, the comment that you made about, about scriptures and how to understand them, very, very good question. The way that I think that you know, scholars of religion, historians of religion, like Jonathan and myself, the way we look at religions or scriptures um, is essentially as a documentation of this sort of experience, the, that this, this historical experience of the transcendence and, and the, the human need to sort of express that through symbols and through metaphors and through stories, through sacred history. Now, you can take a completely secularist view of it and say that the value of this, this text is to provide us uh, this conception of the evolution of thought that is, is necessary when, when talking about you know, our uh, uh, ever-changing experience of, of the divine. So that the scriptures, so when you read the Book of Mormon, for instance, which is about 150 years old, it has a profoundly different sense of morality than, say, the Book of Genesis does, or that the Mahabharata does, or the Ramayana does, or the Gita does, etc., etc. Um, but there is another way of looking at scripture, and, if, and it, it's sort of the faith perspective, if you will, that what we see here in this long and intimately connected history of, of religion is not just an attempt for human beings to describe their, their numinous encounter with the divine, with the transcendence, their experience of transcendence, uh, but there's another aspect to it in that there is a, a, an attempt by that transcendent reality to sort of communicate itself, to self-communicate itself uh, to, to human beings and that these scriptures are sort of those experiences of it. So in that sense, I don't think you need to invalidate one scripture uh, because of how old it is, or you don't need to invalidate one scripture in comparison to another scripture. You just have to understand that these are the attempts, the ongoing attempts of humanity, which will go on for thousands of years. We've been talking about the death of God for a long, long time, and it hasn't happened. It's going to go on for a thousands of years, but it is going to change as our understanding of reality changes, as we change the way in which we express this, this experience. So in many ways, to me, the, the real prophets in our myths are the scientists, are the theoretical uh, physicists who are trying to uh, uh, pr create a different language through which we can understand reality. Well, we actually agree there, uh, and it's my main gripe with religion is that it is the one mode of discourse that resists change so mightily. I mean, that you can't rewrite the Quran, you can't <clears throat> rewrite the Bible. Uh, at the most you can do is dicker with it within the under the aegis of some sanctioned mode of uh, exegesis. And you can't get really far away from it. You can't you can't divorce yourself so totally from the concept of jihad, the concept of martyrdom, so as to render it utterly moot. Uh, you still have, you have to have to find some way of squinting your eyes and turning your head so as to, as to stand, to hold people like Osama bin Laden in abeyance. Uh, if you, and, if and, you prescribe and, to the Quran, yes. Okay, and I agree that that has to be done, but look at what we are, uh, look at the alternative we are forsaking. The alternative is 
a truly open-ended, unconstrained discourse about the human experience. I mean, the fact is, people have spiritual experiences. I um, mean, you've, you've used this word transcendent a lot. Who knows what that means? Well, the, the reality is, it is possible for a person to close their eyes and use their attention in a certain way, such that they no longer feel separate from the universe, say. You know, they, they felt it was just me a moment ago, and then all of a sudden there's just the world, okay? That is an experience that is replicable, that we can all have, that many of us, I'm sure, have had. Most people, most of the time, have had these experiences in the context of a religious tradition, and they have interpreted them by the light of their religious tradition. The problem with this process is that it, uh, it, it is not, in, in, the, in the scientific spirit, encouraging of rigorous honesty. It is encouraging of, of uh, dogmatism and metaphysical speculation. And uh, yes, there are diamonds in the dunghill of religion. I mean, it's, you know, the, Rumi and Meister Eckhart are attesting to a kind of experience that I think we should all be desperate to have. The problem is we need to talk about it honestly. And I think I mean, the, the first thing you can notice about this is if a Christian is having a glorious uh, experience of self-transcendence, and a Buddhist is having a, is having a glorious experience of self-transcendence. One thing you know for, for certain, the best interpretation of that data can't be that Jesus is the Son of God put here on earth to redeem our sins. I mean, that, it, it, it can't, it does not authenticate what the Christian thinks it's authenticating. It doesn't authenticate what the Buddhist thinks it's authenticating. We, we, we no longer have a right to our religious provincialism. We just have to talk but straight. I, but it I does wanna... authenticate the experience Absolutely. itself. Absolutely. And regardless of how one uses, you know, the language of Christianity, the language of Buddhism to sort of contextualize it and understand it, uh, be because those languages are different and indeed because they, they clash with each other, says nothing about the reality of the experience whatsoever, nor for that matter, as you, as you seem to, to suggest a little bit, does our, our, simply our knowledge of the mechanism uh, through which one experiences these these kinds of transcendent realities, that the fact that we know how it happens, we understand sort of the chemical framework that that uh, creates these kinds of quote unquote religious experiences, that does not make those experiences any less real, uh, particularly since nothing exists in reality that is not you know the the sum of these chemical experiences. So. You know, I, I think we should be very careful about saying, well, science has explained mysticism as, you know, A, B, and C in the brain. So? Yeah, I, don't, I don't see but, how understanding how something works. I'm going to uh, foreclose this real. conversation. We're going to do two more questions, and I'm going to implore my fellow uh, talkers to talk a little more briefly in no response. Way. Yes. No way. Because then we can go sell some books. <laughs> uh, it's very late for me to make this comment in, in, in the form of a question, but it's what actually interests me more than what you disagree on, both of you, is if you both agree that we have a problem with fundamentalists, and we have a problem with aggressive fundamentalists, and we have a problem with um, violent and suicidal fundamentalists, and you both have thought and feel passionately about the arena of this, what the two of you might do with an hour and a half of trying to figure out what we do about that. Because I think that's actually more profound and interesting than what you disagree about. Well, but that's, I think, the thing that we disagree about most. And I, I don't want to put, I don't want to put words into Sam's mouth, uh, but Sam has said on a n numerous occasions that uh, it's religion that's at fault because there is no sort of sympathy for moderate forms of any kind of religion. Indeed, Sam says that it is the moderates who pave the way, who give the, the excuse for the, for the extremists and the fundamentalists. So you want to get rid of fundamentalism? You want to get rid of extremism? Get rid of religion. I couldn't disagree more uh, simply because I don't think religion is something that one gets rid of. Religion is the language that we describe these experiences that have always been with us and will always be with us. And that language will change just as religion will change. But nevertheless, uh, to me, the answer to, to uh, uh, rooting out extremism 
is well, it depends. I mean, certainly, like there's no talking to Bin Laden. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna change the guy's mind about anything. So there's no reason to try. But I'm talking about sort of traditionalism and conservatism, evangelicalism. You know, those those kinds of what we would refer to as fringe, perhaps even irrational views of of religion. The way to to combat that is through rational views of religion, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. One more question, and then we'll uh, adjourn. Hi, uh, Rosa. I actually don't think Sam disagrees that much with you. I think he, he feels perhaps that if it was rational from the point of view that the world was expressing themselves off the scriptures that they read, that then religion would be okay because it would fall into a range like astrology or something because people would see it as a part of their lives versus inflict it on others. However, I think that there seems to be something missing here in the whole discussion of the Middle East and perhaps uh, fun, uh, fanaticism throughout the world is the issues that the institutions of religion, such as the church or clerics, um, evangelical—I mean, fanatic—you know, the fanatics of the South, excuse me—but they exist. And um, the issue of literacy. I mean, that's how this has been controlled for so long, and why, if you can't read the Quran for yourself and make interpretations, logical interpretations for yourself, and you have to believe what someone's expressing to you. It doesn't really matter what the Quran says or what the Bible says or the Old Testament in Judaism because someone else is telling you what to believe. I think that may be a big part of the historical problem here. Uh, please respond briefly because then we'll, 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 we're going to shut it down. Well, I think I'm responding mostly to what Reza just said. Um, this, this, <laughs> the, uh, not, not to disrespect your question, but uh, I agree with your point that we, we don't disagree as much as we have seemed to. Um, the, the issue is that there's no reason for us to have this denominational language. If we are in the business of simply describing transcendent experience, how we have them, what they're like, what, we, what is reasonable to conclude on, on their basis, um, Neurochemistry is a part of that, but I agree with you. It does not subsume the whole conversation. Um, uh, if we are in that business, there is no room for a Buddhist version of it, a Christian version of it, in the same way that there's no room for Christian physics. I mean, the, the Christians invented physics, but physics, because it was a real domain of inquiry, floated free of its Christian roots. There's no such thing as American science versus Japanese science. I mean, science is science because it is the one mode of discourse where we are rigorously honest with ourselves. We, everyone is in the business of proving everyone else wrong. Uh, you can actually win points for proving yourself wrong in science. This doesn't happen in religion, and it should. And if it did, it would have a winning, a winnowing effect that would be catastrophic for the religious enterprise, and then we would be left with mystical scientists. Well, I think that um, it's certainly true. I mean, that 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 you know, science has sort of rules and regulations that are far different than than rules and regulations of theology. But because that's because they are alternative modes of knowing. They're alternative means through which you, you probe reality. And and while science unquestionably has a monopoly on facts. It has no monopoly on truth, quite the opposite. And the idea that sort of physicality or materiality are the, the sole means through which one can uh, investigate reality, through, one, through which one can probe reality, I think is something that even science itself would, would probably Where have I claimed that? Dis disagree with. No, I'm saying that that's sort of the, the scientific conception that, you know, uh, anything that cannot be a part of our empirical, uh, you know, uh, observation, our, our empirical experience of the world, then is beyond sort of the the realm of science, and so therefore cannot be discussed in the way that that this sort of um, high kind of concept of of the rules of dialogue and discussion that that you just spoke about with 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 science. I mean, I I think that it's it's easy, I think, for all of us to sort of point to the faults of religion or to the to the prejudices or the biases of religious people and then to sort of make generalized comments about religion in general to me that is a profoundly unscientific way of discussing religion science certainly does have a role to play in religion but science also uses the same kinds of, of language to describe similar experiences. When Dawkins refers to memes, I, I don't really understand what the difference between memes and, and you know, the way that, that, uh, that uh, 
Sufis describe, you know, the, 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 the matter of the universe is I don't really understand that. When, when he refers to, for instance, this, this notion of, um, you know, uh, of transcendence or mysticism being a, a, a result of, of simulation software in the brain or something, that's just simply a new language, a new means to describe the same experience or, the, you know, um, something else that he says, um, had or, you know, hyperactive... Uh, agent development, this this belief that we are sort of hardwired to expect, you know, a agency when it doesn't exist. So we mistake, you know, coincidences or or spiritual experiences. We 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 uh, we mistake coincidences for spiritual experiences, etc. Or we mistake chemical, you know, things that are going on in our brain for mystical experiences. Again, that is merely an an alternative language a scientific yeah. language in this way to describe uh, modes of reality. Um, it's not any more or less legitimate in the dialogue than, than religion is, but it certainly has a monopoly on facts and on causation. And in that sense, it has a, I think, you know, a, a higher level, particularly in these kinds of discussions that, that we're having uh, than, so than I'm, religion. I'm sorry, it's my happy does. duty sure. to bring this conversation to an end. On behalf of all the lucky ticket holders, uh, and myself, I want to thank Sam and Reza for an evening of fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Sam Harris and Reza Aslan from the L.A. Public Library.